All right, welcome to um, our strategy, strategy session number one. And we're gonna have at least two of these, but maybe this can be something we periodically do as, as our church grows and develops. So the key verse that I'd like us to think about is Proverbs, Proverbs 16, three. Commit your works to the Lord and your plans will be established. So that's what we want to do. We want to commit our, our good works, our works as a church to the Lord. And we want to plan too. And it's really only through, through the Lord that those plans happen. Another great verse is uh, the horses are prepared for the day of battle, but victory comes from the Lord. So there's preparation on our part, but the ultimate victory comes from God. So for this morning, um, just our schedule, we'll, I'll do a short talk. We um, then we'll do a brainstorm on mission, vision, vision, and values. We did that last year, but I think it's good to, to redo again. Then I'll pass out a questionnaire for you to fill out. And then that'll lead into to morning tea. Then when we come back after the break, we will do uh, more brainstorming and start to get more specific. We'll look at the, the environment in which we are, both external to the church and then our, what, who we are, who, who we are as a church. And then we'll look at two categories of planning um, in particular. That's discipleship. That's making disciples, growing, growing our, our church to spiritual maturity. And then also some administrative aspects. We won't focus on leadership and outreach today just for lack of time. Okay, so that's kind of our schedule. So let's do our short talk on strategic planning. So in this short talk, we'll cover 10 quick areas, the definition of strategic planning, its importance, some core concepts, the theology behind planning, as a church, the purpose of church planning, some caveats, stakeholders, tools that are useful in, in planning, and then the process and areas of planning. So just to give us a quick definition of what strategic planning in the church means, I like these two different definitions. One is by J.M. Bryson. He said, it's a disciplined, and one second, my, I need to move this away so I can read it. There we go. So uh, Jane Bryson said, strategic planning is a disciplined effort to produce fundamental decisions and actions that shape and guide what an organization is, what it does, and why it does it with a focus on the future. So a couple of things to point out in this definition is it's a disciplined effort, and you've shown discipline by waking up at 9 a, you know, getting here at 9 a.m. on a Saturday. So thank you for that. Um, it does deal with fundamental decisions, kind of the most important, crucial decisions of the church. They, these decisions guide what the church does, why it does it, and with a focus on the future. So I think that's a really good definition. Another definition is by one of my professors at DTS and at Dallas Seminary. And that's in a book called Advanced Strategic Planning. And he defines it this way. Strategic planning is the fourfold process that a point leader, such as a pastor, works through regularly with a team of leaders to envision or re-envision and revitalize his church by developing a biblical mission and a compelling vision, discovering its core values, and crafting a strategy that implements a unique, authentic church model. So you see there's four things there, mission, vision, values, and strategy. And it's unique to each individual church. One thing he says in that book is you can't just go to a church conference and, and hear what everyone else is doing and then come back and say, okay, I've got this, the special key, the special ingredient. Let's do it like this church. It never works. You always have to tailor everything to, um, to your specific people and your specific community. So the importance of strategic planning, um, it, it makes a difference in your church's life. People know 
what's happening. They understand where the church is going. So they're more likely to buy in and choose your church because they, they know you have a, a plan. They know you have a goal. Um, it also enables us as a church to say who we are and kind of what we stand for and where we're going and how we're going to get there. Now, of course, God can always come in and change things, but at least you've thought, had a good think about, you know, who you are, where you're going, and how to get there. In the long run, like, say, 30, 30 years from now, as we look back, or as someone looks back on the church's history, and if, if the Lord tarries, of course, but, you know, it does impact the long-term life of the church, and it makes a you know, churches have chapters in their history, and we we entered a new chapter a couple years ago, and um, we're starting to grow, and now we have new challenges and new decisions, and so um, planning helps us to know what the big picture is so that we can make the right decisions in the short term. And finally, the it's important because it addresses alignment issues, you know, we have to, you know, we're all kind of, you know, there's a lot of churches in town and which, which church in Dunedin aligns most with who I am and my beliefs as a Christian and my ministry and my friendships, you know, and so that's something that's important. Like you want to believe, really believe in your church, believe in its theology, but also believe in its practice and so when when we know what we stand for, you know, we may get some people to come in because they were a church that's more in alignment with their values. Some people, too, may leave the church. And that's that's a normal, normal, um, normal thing in the life of the church. So if we're clear on what we believe and who we are, uh, what hills we're going to die on and what hills we're not going to die on, then we can make a informed choice about, yeah, I want to pour myself into this church, or no, it's probably better for us to look for a, a new church. So that's why it's important. Murray Brown, do you know, any of you know Murray Brown? He, he heads up, uh, he's, he heads up Triple C and Z's youth leader ministry. Um, he, in his book, he says, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. And he didn't come up with that quote, but that's just where I got it from. So we should, many churches don't really, people come, they know that they worship, they have Bible studies, but maybe, you know, it's unclear what the church is overall aiming at. Is it just there to survive or does it have like a, a goal? Is it and what is that goal? Is it to reach the community? Is it to grow? Is it to plant more churches? Is it to, to, to see something happen like what we see in the book of Acts, you know? And so in, the, in New Zealand and Dunedin, churches have been dying and, and getting smaller generally. And that's not, the, that's not what Jesus wants, right? So we, we, should, we should have it in our heart to aim at something more than just surviving and maintaining the status quo. And that's really what I hope for us. Failing to plan is planning to fail. So core concepts in uh, strategic planning are mission, vision, vision, values, and strategy. So the mission is a broad, bi brief, biblical statement of what the church is supposed to be doing. I know Jeff and Lindsay, uh, in past years, you've had a mission statement. What remind me what it was? Oh, too long ago now. <laughs> yeah, it was leaders. Something about leaders. Sometimes the church. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes pointed on the top of us on the home. Some to leadership and all to maturity. Yeah. Some to leadership, all to maturity. Yeah. Yeah. So did what did you come up with that like? in a collaborative process or that was it was part of a um of a church seminar because of growth seminar program that we went to and a book that we used as elders to yeah put things together. with roland foreman yeah or one of his yeah okay so mission is usually like you know like coca-cola company you know it's like 
a Coca-Cola bottle in the hands of every person on earth, you know, or something like that. You know, it's, it's something short, short and snappy. Um, team of five, team of five million, you know, team of five. We're being recorded, guys. But t- OK, so vision, vision. So vision is an exciting and attractive picture of what the church will look like in the next five to 10 years as it accomplishes its mission. So vision is probably more important than mission because vision is something you can, you can feel it's more emotive. It's, you can smell it. You can, you, you know it when it's there, you know, and, and it's something that's exciting that, wow, that church, yeah, they have, they have it together and they're going somewhere. So that, and it has to do with kind of five to 10 years out. I like to think even longer, like 30 years, but it's hard to do that because we never know what's going to happen tomorrow, but five to 10 years. So vision. So our church, I pray that we'll have, have a vision. And then values are the church's principles and standards that empower and guide it as it pursues its mission and vision. It's kind of like the guardrails, um, uh, the boundaries for us. I mean, we, we did some of this last year and biblical or, you know, basically teaching and preaching the Bible and God's word was num- the number one core value. And we've, you've really seen that this year in our Bible studies and our preaching and everything we do, we're focused on the God's word. And so I hope and expect that to continue to be one of our values, but there's others as well. And then strategy is how the church accomplishes its mission and vision in four key areas, leadership, administration, discipleship, and outreach. So leadership has to do with elders, how decisions are made, how leaders are developed, and prayer, and strategic planning, what we're doing today. Administration has to do with finances, facility, staffing, um, legal compliance, and communication, you know, promoting your church and sending emails and stuff like that. Discipleship is how believers grow to spiritual maturity and then reproduce. And then outreach is, of course, evangelism and reaching out to the lost in the community. So I, I think those four areas, if you do, if you look at everything, everything we do should be tied to one of those four, four areas of strategy. Okay, I'm just going to read this quote. So is it biblical to plan and to go through a strategic planning process? Well, um, I'm going to read two quotes, both from Aubrey Malfers, one about the Old Testament and one about the New Testament. I just think they, they nail it. So numerous leaders in the Old Testament thought and acted strategically. Moses, in response to God's mission to lead Israel out of Egypt, led them strategically through the wilderness, as recorded in the Pentateuch. In Exodus, Moses' father-in-law, Jethro, challenges him to think and act strategically in his counseling of individual Israelites. The leadership of Moses' successor, Joshua, was most strategic. The writer of First Chronicles notes that the men of Issachar understood the times and knew what Israel should do. Nehemiah thought and acted strategically as he led God's revitalization project in Jerusalem. Proverbs presents God's wisdom and role in planning. And as we turn to the New Testament, Aubrey Malfers continues, in the Gospels, Christ informs us, informs the church of its mission, the Great Commission, in Acts 1.8, he gives the church its geographical strategy and direction. The book of Acts records how the Holy Spirit used the church strategically to implement this mission, especially through the missionary journeys. And Paul did not wander aimlessly, but appears to have carefully and strategically selected the cities he visited for ministry while on his missionary journeys. For example, he located in Ephesus because it was the gateway to Asia Minor. According to Luke, the, God, the Godhead thinks and acts strategically, see Acts 2 and Acts 4. In Ephesians 5, 15 to 16, Paul encourages the Ephesian church to live strategically. 
we just study deficiencies. I think that's um, make the most of the time for the days are evil. So that means have priorities, think strategically about what you put your effort in. So we could give many other examples, um, but planning is not evil. It's a good thing. But of course, uh, well, we'll get into the caveats. I'll leave it there. So the strategic planning is, is biblical and theologically um, justified. So the purpose of strategic planning is to discover our strengths, limitations, and weaknesses, to build on our strengths and minimize our weaknesses, to facilitate communication and build trust between each other, to implement spiritually healthy, Christ-honoring change. And that's the hardest part, you know, Hopefully, if, you, if, if you're doing strategic planning right, there will be some things that need to be changed. That's always going to be true. And change is hard. But if you, can, if you can do a process together of strategic planning that involves everyone who wants to be involved, which is what the beauty of this is, then you can make those changes that are for the good of the overall mission and vision that you're doing. It's to get leaders in the congregation on the same page, which can be a problem. It's always, always can be a problem. Um, to understand and relate more effectively to the community. To more effectively and efficiently make disciples. To make wise decisions about facilities and location. To analyze the budget and raise funds. And to evaluate and improve our ministries. So these are some of the purposes of strategic planning. Now, these caveats are important. Our relationship with God is far more important to him than any planning we do. Amen. We must not overdo strategy. God honors those who just keep doing the right things. So strategy isn't everything. Yeah, a great strategy is valueless if it's merely words on a document or ambitious, ambitious goals carved onto the wall. Have you ever seen that happen before? It happens all the time. And that's not what we want to do at all. So we could have the greatest strategy to win Caversham for Christ, but if it's not something we really can do or want to do or uh, don't have enough people to do or don't have the energy or time to do, then it's a waste of time. We must allow God to interrupt or redirect our plans anytime he wants. And we are to hold our plans uh, in an open hand before the sovereign God of the universe. I think those are really good caveats. Um, culture, the church, church's culture is more important than strategy. And by culture, culture is like how we do things around here. That's more important than strategy. Samuel Chan said, culture, not vision or strategy, is the most powerful factor in any organization. Think of Apple. What do you know about Apple's culture as a company? How, how would you describe it? <laughs> Crooks? Uh, careful. <laughs> Steve Jobs, what would you say they're innovative at least and proprietary, <laughs> greedy maybe, but they've been very successful, right? I mean, you have to give them that they've been very successful. And if you read a little bit about them, they're just, they, they prioritize, they actually encourage employees to make mistakes to be innovative, to think creatively, you know, and there's something to be said for that kind of culture because they've been able to develop the iPhone and the MacBook and uh, the, do you have an Apple watch? No. <laughs> okay. So culture. And as Peter Drucker, the famous uh, business um, author said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So culture I mean, you guys have had a culture before our family came here. 
and it's still there. It's still there, but it's adjusted as new people, as we've come in and different people have come in. So it's, it's all, culture is always changing, but um, culture is more important. And it's part of leadership. It's part of the elder's job, really, to create or to, to push the church in the direction of the culture that's best for the mission and vision. Is every, anyone cold? Yeah. I'm a little cold. So if you want to turn that up. And as Mike Tyson said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, as Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they are punched in the mouth. <laughs> so stake uh, stakeholders, um, let's keep in mind everyone who is involved with strategic planning. First and foremost, it's God. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit are all involved right now in planning our church. They're leading the charge. Proverbs 16, 9, the heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his steps. And Proverbs 19, 21, many are the plans in the mind of a man, but it is the purpose of the Lord that will stand. So God is in charge, but there's also church leaders, elders. So thank, um, thank, yeah, two elders are here, a former elders here. Steve's coming. Ed's probably working on the pro property, but he sent his, his uh, associate there, <laughs> his proxy. So, um, so church leaders definitely, they kind of, you know, are the human leaders of the of the strategic planning thing congregation needs to be involved and that's why you're here um, and we'll continue to involve you and others but i think sometimes we miss the the community outside the church they have a stake in this too and we need to keep their needs and their eternal needs in mind as we're planning it's not just about us um, it's about them you know, it is about us. God is building his church, but the community, yeah, the community is like, they, they need to be, we need to consist, consistently put them at the forefront of our minds when we're planning so that it does, we don't become insular. And um, it's good to have outside advisors. I did invite Peter Shane and Simon Rosie Sim, but Peter had to back out at the last minute and I'm not Sure, Simon and Rosie have a newborn, so maybe that's what prevented them from coming. Without counsel, plans fail, but with many advisors, they succeed. So you are the many advisors to the, to the elders. So some of the tools we can use in strategic planning are brainstorming. We'll be doing that. Also storyboarding. Um, scale of one to 10, this is useful. Uh, just if you ever do anything like this, if you want to get if you want to know what topics need to be discussed more and which really don't need to be discussed, you can do scale of one to 10. And if most people say, yeah, I agree with that on a, on an, at an eight or a nine or a 10, and most people are saying that, then Lindsay would be happy. We don't need to discuss it. It's, it's, already, it's already done. But if a lot of people are like four, seven, five, then that's something that you, you deserves more discussion. And finally, the last tool is consensus. Um, majority vote is not a good way to make decisions. And elders, eldership doesn't make decisions like that and neither should a church. It is more by consensus. So it's something you kind of feel. Um, you, you need to, you know, you can be blindsided and think that we have a consensus when we really don't. So you don't wanna do that. But you need to have a fair open discussion with all points of view coming in, people get their day in court, but at the end of the day, a consensus arrives, the church makes a decision, and then you, if you disagree with that decision, you, you still, it's been a process, the process has been fair, you've been able to speak your mind, and so you should, you know, ideally you should put your weight behind the consensus that has arrived, so those are some of the tools. So the process that we'll go through is prayer, I did, I did pray on Tuesday night and was hoping more people would come. It was just me and April. On, April was on Zoom. But 
we do need, I, th I do think we do need to pray more corporately, just overall as a church. But that was my attempt to start this process in prayer. And I know God heard, and you may have been praying, you know, just not in that meeting, but continue to pray for this process. Um, theology, environmental scan, mission, vision, values, strategy, implementation, and assessment. That's kind of the the process of strategic planning. Um, when you get into the strat the actual strategy of how you're going to do things, it's I think it's really wise to set concrete goals because goals really do motivate action. Like Jock, you know, will set a he'll sign up for a marathon, and that motivates him to train according to a schedule. Um, a lot of people aren't used to setting goals and they just kind of, they, they get things done, but they don't get like maybe as much done as they would like. And, and that's, that's true for all of us. So goals together in an organization or a church are really, really beneficial. And to be a good goal, um, it should be smart. It should be simple. It should be motivating. It should be agreed upon. So I can't oppose my goals on all of you. That would be a bad goal. So it needs to be agreed. It needs to be realistic and time limited. It should have like, you know, by X date, we want to get our health and safety plan done. Something like that. So, and areas, we've talked about that leadership, administration, discipleship, and outreach. For this morning, we're going to be focused on discipleship and administration. So that's it. We've talked about a definition of strategic planning, its importance, some core concepts, the theology, the purpose, some caveats with Mike Tyson, um, the stakeholders, the tools that can be used, the process, and the areas of strategic planning. So that concludes my presentation and I'll go ahead and stop this. Oh, I didn't actually.